Hi. Good morning. Welcome to um, this session of the uh, online national school. Um, I'll be starting off this morning uh, talking about the Marxist Leninist definition of the working class. You know, a lot of definitions of the working class out there, um, but only one that's going to allow us to play our role um, in history, uh, which is to uh, lead the struggle to liberate humanity from capitalism. Um, so that's the subtitle, who we are, what we share, and why we have to save the world. And most of this is going to be um, not uh, any, you know, groundbreaking step forward in, in uh, Marxist thinking. This is kind of a summing up of the science that has been developed by, by working class people over generations and generations um, in struggle. Um, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit as well about the differences between um, maybe the Communist Party's way of approaching what we might call theoretical work um, compared to an academic way uh, and, and why that definition uh, matters. Um, that's my slides here. So the content is going to be uh, really divided up into five parts, though not of equal length. Um, first, we're going to talk about after I introduce myself a little more fully, we'll talk about what defines the working class, who's included in the working class. Um, we'll touch on, you know, whether there's always been a working class, and if not, how did it come into being? Um, the bulk of this is going to be uh, sections, uh, section three, the common experiences that define working class life under capitalism. Um, and that's where I hope we can take some time for discussion when, when the presentation's over about how we see uh, some of uh, what Marx and Engels and Lenin are talking about in our own uh, workplaces, in our own lives, um, and in, in the struggles uh, that we're engaged in. Um, we'll ask the question of whether the working class has a culture of its own and what's the basis of that culture. And finally, we'll talk about um, competition and collective power, uh, the, the great contradiction at the heart of capitalism, um, the one that Marx sums up by saying that uh, what capital, what the capitalist class produces above all are its own grave diggers. Um, the fact that as uh, the working class grows, uh, as it works more and more collectively, um, it develops the strength to challenge capital. Um, so uh, that's kind of the, the brief overview of uh, of what we're going to do. Um, and I think I'll kind of start off with who I am and how I became a Marxist. Uh, as I said, my name is Scott Hiley. I grew up in a working class family in northern Pennsylvania, in a small rural town. Um, my dad worked in construction. My mom uh, was a child care worker and then a, a clerical worker at a hospital. Um, I was the first person on either side of my family to do a four-year college degree. I ended up going on to graduate school and became a professor of um, French and, and French literature. And I never really studied Marxism um, as I was going through my academic career. Even though I worked on literature and economic and legal history of the Middle Ages, it wasn't, I mean, aside from kind of broadly a historical materialist perspective, it wasn't really any significant engagement with, with Marxism. And uh, the way I encountered Marx uh, and Engels uh, really was um, trying to fill in kind of holes in my training, you know, read up on the great thinkers, be conversant with their ideas, this and that. And it was, I was doing that uh, when I had my first real university job that was in, uh, 2007 to 2009, I was teaching at Reed College. Um, and my second year was a two-year position. Um, I was on the job market. Um, jobs in medieval French literature are not easy to come by. Uh, and this was also at the lowest point, the worst point of the um, economic crisis of 2008 to um, whenever it will end. Uh, and in the middle of all that, you know, staring down the, the 
face of unemployment and, and so forth, I came upon this passage from Engels' Condition of the Working Class. I'm not gonna read the whole thing because we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, but um, you know, uh, who assures the, the worker that they're gonna have work tomorrow? No one. Um, the worker knows that any turn of events could put him out of a job. He knows that he, though he may have the means of living today, it's very uncertain whether he shall tomorrow. And, you know, reading that just, it hit me, right? That, um, you know, that, that I was a member of the working class, um, that my colleagues who'd spent their whole lives saving for retirement and then had, you know, a year away from retirement, half their savings stripped away by this crisis. Um, this is exactly what uh, Engels was talking about, this sense of insecurity. And that for me was a, a pretty kind of profound thing. And it started me down the road of, of reading Marx, not out of intellectual curiosity, but as a, a kind of a political and, and philosophical guy. And over my next few years teaching in the um, in university, I did, I did end up getting a job and I was able to, as I was developing as a Marxist and joining the Communist Party and seeing how things work there, I was also looking at how Marxism happened in the academy or how it was done. Um, and it's very different. Uh, so on the academic side, um, you produce research because you need to get a job and hold a job. So to do that, you have to produce new stuff. You have to say something new. So the focus is on saying something novel, um, saying something different from what other people are saying, not necessarily what's you know, correct, what's necessary, what's most helpful for the working class, but um, on getting your name cited. And in that sense, it's distant from the realities of working class life and culture, and it becomes individualistic and competitive. Uh, on the other hand, what I was seeing in the party, and it was, you know, I won't, I won't lie, it, it took some getting used to, but it was not driven by the need to hold a job. It's driven by the need to free ourselves and our class and humanity. And the focus is not on saying something new, it's on developing this collective experience and analysis that has been carried on by generation after generations of, of workers. Um, and finally, that everybody has a role in theory and analysis. It's not you know, a privileged um, preserve of a few specially trained uh, intellectuals that we, we all bring something to the table. So it was very different. And I should say, I'm not saying that everything that comes out of university departments is bad, by no means. Um, some of it can be very useful, very interesting, um, but it is constrained by the capitalist foundation of the university. Um, and we do things a little differently. Um, the big difference being individual on the one side versus collective on the other. And that's gonna be kind of a theme uh, as we go through this. So what defines the working class? We look to Marx. A um, Couple of, of quotes uh, from the first chapter of the manifesto. In proportion as the bourgeoisie, that is capital, is developed in the same proportion as the proletariat, the modern working class developed a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work and who find work only so long as their labor increases capital. So uh, the working class works, um, they have to work to live, and the only way they can find work is by putting themselves at the service of capital. And down in the second quote, um, Marx, this is from the chapter six of the first volume of Capital, where Marx talks about the process of buying and selling labor power. Um, a, a worker is someone who has no other commodity for sale and who is short of everything necessary for the realization of labor power. Um, that is to say, we can't uh, produce enough for ourselves to live. We don't control enough of the means of production uh, to use our labor power to support ourselves. We've been separated from the means of production. And that's kind of where Marx goes. This is the follow-up to that second quote from the first slide. Nature does not produce on the one side owners of money or commodities, and on the other people possessing nothing but their own labor power. This relation has no natural basis, 
neither is its social basis one that is common to all historical periods. It is clearly the result of a past historical development, the product of many economic revolutions, of the extinction of a whole series of older forms of social production. So the working class is new. The working class came about under capitalism, and it came about, as Marx will explain in the next chapter, um, or in, in chapter uh, 26 of Capital, the first volume of Capital, rather, uh, through a process of extreme violence, where workers, uh, where people who would become workers were separated from the means of production. So in, um, in the United Kingdom, for example, this took the form of turning common land into private land, of kicking uh, the farmers who were using it to raise crops for themselves or um, you know, have a few sheep on, they were kicked off, that land was taken, they were reduced to poverty um, and forced to um, seek out wage work. Um, the same thing happened in Ireland and Scotland, landlords you know, ev evicting tenants en masse, um, the process of forcing people into the, into the labor force included even in England, slavery, the enslavement of, uh, of people who had been kicked off their land, um, uh, you know, who were, who were branded and uh, enslaved if they refused to um, seek out work in, in workhouses or hire them out for whatever, hire themselves out for whatever paltry wage. It was an extremely violent process. Um, and that process was also uh, in the Americas, uh, the process of um, seizing uh, land from indigenous people, displacing them, and of enslaving um, Africans to work in um, a plantation system that developed within capitalism. So the working class is has not always existed. Work has always existed. Work is part of who we are as human beings, for Marx. Um, but the working class as a class of people cut off from the means of production of people who have no choice but to sell their ability to work to a capitalist, um, that is something new. So what experiences do members of the working class have under capitalism? We are dependent. Um, so this is from Engels' uh, condition of the working class. Um, what the proletarian needs, he can obtain only from the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, which is protected in its monopoly by the power of the state. We have no choice but to depend on capital. This makes me think, you know, of those those sometimes you hear those right wing trolls talking about, um, oh, you know, you hate capitalism. Like, I notice you're wearing clothes. I notice you have an iPhone or, you know, whatever. But that's kind of the point, right? Everything we need is controlled by capital. There is no escaping from it. And this is from Marx's uh, pamphlet, Wage Labor and Capital. Um, when wage labor produces the alien wealth dominating it, the power hostile to it, capital, there flow back to it its means of employment, its means of subsistence, under the condition that it again become a part of capital that it become again the lever whereby capital is to be forced into an accelerated expansive movement. As long as the wage laborer remains a wage laborer, his lot is dependent upon capital. That is what the boasted community of interests between workers and capitalists amounts to, right? This is a hostage situation. Workers, as workers, are hostage to the whims of the capitalist class. Uh, we can't do, the only way we can stay alive is by increasing capital, by using our labor power, which is the source of all value, as, as Carl explained in the, um, the class on Thursday, um, or on Tuesday, rather, to, um, to increase the wealth of the ruling class. And as capital accumulates, as the wealth of the capitalist class grows, the dependence of the working class grows. This is one of the really interesting parts uh, about Marx's argument. And he develops it in, mostly in chapter 25 of Capital. It's called the, the General Law of Capitalist Accumulation, that 
the more capital accumulates, the more the wealth of the capitalist class grows, the worse it gets for workers, right? Which is, which is exactly the opposite of the argument that most bourgeois economists make, right? They'll talk about, oh, you know, um, as, as productivity rises, wages will rise and a lot of bigger, will grow the whole pie and uh, you might not get a bigger slice, but your slice will be bigger anyway, this and that. Um, and Marx says, no, that's bullshit, right? Um, and this is, this is one of my favorites. This is, Marx says, in the best possible case, when productivity is growing and the economy is growing and um, you know, there's, there's a job for everybody and wages are going up, there's a rise in the price of labor as a consequence of the accumulation of capital only means in fact the length and weight of the golden chain the wage laborer has already forged for himself allow it to be loosened somewhat. When wages go up because of the um, because of a demand for labor, um, it still keeps workers in dependence on the capitalist class. This is a defining feature of the working class is our, our dependence. And another is that because of this dependence on the capitalist class, we have no security, right? Um, and this is the quote from Engels that I started with, but I'm gonna go through it a little, a little more length now. Um, true, it is only individuals who starve, but what security has the worker that it may not be their turn tomorrow? Who assures them employment? Who vouches for it that if for any reason or no reason, his Lord and master discharges them tomorrow, they can struggle along with those dependent on them until they may find someone else to give them bread. Who guarantees that willingness to work shall suffice to obtain work, that uprightness, industry, thrift, and the rest of the virtues recommended by the bourgeoisie are really their road to happiness? No one. He knows that they, they know that they have something today and that it does not depend on themselves whether they shall have something tomorrow. They know that every breeze that blows, every whim of their employer, every bad turn of trade may hurl them back into the fierce whirlpool from which they have temporarily saved themselves and in which it is hard and often impossible to keep their head above water. They know that though they may have the means of living today, it is very uncertain whether they shall tomorrow. Um, and this, so th this, um, this work, uh, Engel's Condition of the Working Class, and especially the chapter uh, called The Great Towns, um, is really for me one of the most profound uh, pieces of uh, working class literature and, and, and science that has been uh, produced because Engels uh, came to England as a young man to uh, learn the business of running a textile mill. His family was a wealthy uh, textile producing family and he was destined to be a member of the ruling class. Um, but he observed and, and studied the condition of workers and wrote this incredible, some people consider it the first uh, uh, scientific work of sociology, in fact. Um, and the whole thing is animated by this outrage um, about uh, the condition of workers. Um, so I really do recommend uh, that work. But So again, um, this is insecurity, precarity, which I'm sure all of us have felt uh, at one point or another as workers. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if at one point we're making a comfortable salary, we have no trouble making rent, we have a little left over at the end of the month. Um, you know, all it takes is one, one setback. You know, we're always working kind of on a tightrope without a net, um, dependent on on the turns of the market and on the whims of the of the capitalists. And this is, you know, Marx repeats the same thing in the, in the manifesto, Marx and Engels, in fact. Um, you know, these laborers who must sell themselves piecemeal are a commodity like every other article of commerce and are consequently exposed to all the vicissitudes of competition and all the fluctuations of the, of the market. So what this means is we have no control or very little control over our own lives. Um, you know, there's this, I don't know what you'd call it, um, 
lie really uh, spread by the capitalist class that if you choose the right career path, get the right education, um, you know, you'll be able to escape from this uncertainty, you'll have a good job. It's not true. No matter, if you are a worker, if you have to sell your labor power to stay alive, then you do not have any control over your own economic destiny. Um, and that's the simple reality of it. The other part of being a worker is that capitalism dehumanizes us. And I've got a bunch of different slides for this, but um, I'm going to sort of um, cut it a little bit short um, and, and really keep it to this one, which I think is very, is my favorite of the quotes anyway. Um, by putting, by the putting of labor power into action, i.e. the work, uh, or the putting of labor power into action, that is the work, is the active expression of the laborer's own life. And this life activity he sells to another person in order to secure the, ne the necessary means of life. His life activity, therefore, is but a means of securing his own existence. He works that he may keep alive. He does not count the labor itself as a part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice of life. What they produce for themselves is not the silk that they weave, nor the gold that they draw up the mining shaft, nor the palaces they build. What they produce for themselves are wages, and the silk, the gold, the palace are resolved for them into a certain quantity of necessaries of life, perhaps into a cotton jacket, into copper coins, and into a basement dwelling. If the silkworm's object in spinning were to prolong its existence as a caterpillar, it would be a perfect example of a wage worker. And um, what Marx is saying here, so for Marx, being what it means to be human, our, our characteristic as humans, is that we can consciously use our mental and physical abilities to transform the world around us in ways that suit us. That's what it is to be human, to be able to consciously transform the world um, uh, through our, our labor power, our work. Um, that's why work is so important in the Marxist conception of the world. Under capitalism, this work, this life activity, this basis of our human existence becomes something for someone else. We have to give away uh, the result of our labor. Um, and instead of the silk and the gold and the palaces that we produce, we end up with the ability to stay alive. That's our share. Um, and this is, um, so Marx is speaking not in a sense, uh, in, in a vague, you know, moralistic way about dehumanization. He's, say, he's saying very concretely, what makes us human Capital is taking that away from us. Capital is destroying that for us. Um, it's turning our work into not an, a fulfillment, a development of our own life, but a sacrifice of our life. Um, and I'm willing to bet that a lot of the people listening right now have, have heard that. Um, so Accumulation of wealth at one pole is at the same time accumulation of misery, the torment of labor, slavery, ignorance, brutalization, and moral degradation at the opposite pole on the side of the class that produces its own product as capital. The, the richer capital gets, the richer the ruling class gets, the worse, the, the more poverty and torment and brutalization are spread among the working class. Um, so there's no, again, Marx will insist all along, there's no way out within capitalism. Capitalism has to go if we are to live full human lives. Um, does the working class have a culture of its own? If so, what is the basis of that culture? And we're running a little uh, short on time here, so I'm going to sum up um, some of these quotes. I will make the, the slideshow available. Um, so, Capitalism forces us together and puts us on a footing of equality. The big reference for this is the first chapter of the manifesto where Marx and Engels will argue that um, capitalism harmonizes everything. Um, it draws the whole world into a market. It puts all workers on the same footing. It drives wages down together. Um, the conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized um, you know, out of, through competition with machinery. Um, 
differences of age and sex no longer have any distinctive social validity because, um, uh, you know, as women uh, and children are drawn into the workforce, um, uh, the sm the lower parts of the middle class, um, small tradespeople, shopkeepers, etc., are forced down into the proletariat, um, to, which is recruited from all classes of the population. Today, we see this in the fact that, you know, what job is there that is now done by by someone who's not a member of the working class? Um, doctors, um, university professors, um, you know, they're forced down into the working class as well, forced to uh, separate it from their ability to make a living on their own and, and forced to um, sell their uh, labor power to someone else. Um, proletarization, every job is transformed into a working class job. So this, it brings us together, it puts us on a footing of, it, of equality, and that is the basis of a working class culture, right? Um, capitalism brings us together, it, it works toward abolishing these differences, and we can see that the, the working class um, has an understanding of equality, of solidarity, uh, that the capitalist class doesn't have. And that's why, um, well, uh, that's why Lenin says the working class has to lead the struggle for democracy, right? Only the working class understands equality. Only the working class understands collective work because we've been, you know, our labor has been forced together, coordinated um, by the capitalist class. Uh, only the working class can understand that everything that advances democracy is in its favor. Um, and any kind of inequality, any kind of domination works against it. And Lenin insists on this over and over again. Only the proletary can be a consistent fighter for democracy. And he'll say later, after the um, after the October Revolution, um, that you know the bourgeois uh, republics they talk a good game about equal rights for women, about religious freedom, about the rights of national minorities, but none of them have solved it. Whereas you know in the first days of the October Revolution, we solved all of those problems in our socialist struggle. So that's what the working class is called to do. Um, the working class, because of its place within capitalism, because of its common experiences, because of its understanding of both equality and oppression, has to lead the struggle for liberation. Um, we can't do that um, effectively because capitalism is constantly putting us in competition with each other. Um, it's through any possible grounds for competition. Um, Engels will say, this competition of the workers among themselves is the worst side of the present state of things and its effect upon the worker, the sharpest weapon against the proletariat in the hands of the bourgeoisie. Hence the effort of the workers to nullify this competition by associations, hence the hatred of the bourgeoisie toward these associations, he's talking about unions, uh, and its triumph in every defeat which befalls them. The struggle of the working class at this moment and throughout its entire uh, struggle for socialism is to overcome this competition that's forced upon it by the capitalist class, to overcome the individualism into which capitalism tries to lock us, to seize on that material basis of working class culture, that collectivity and equality that capitalism against its own best interests has put us in and to develop that into a new form of society. Um, I'm going to uh, stop there, um, and we do have um, a few minutes for um, contributions, uh, comments, questions, and I'd especially like to hear um, uh, people's experiences of some of these aspects of capitalism that we've seen Marx and Engels and Lenin talked about, and um, the ways in which you've uh, worked against them, the way the ways you've um, also experienced, you know, this working class culture of, of solidarity and of uh, equality and democracy. Um, thank you. Uh, Dee, if you could open the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, there will be a second part to this class, so please stay with us. 
if you at, at this point, if you'd like to make a comment or qu introduce a question, please uh, click the picture of the hand, click the picture uh, of the uh, raised hand so that we can know you want to speak um, and we will open your mic on our end. If you want to speak, you can click the picture of the hand and open your mic uh, and then we'll open it. Open Carrie uh, Broski, open your mic, please. Click the picture, there you are. Hi, yeah, I was just curious, what is, how, how do we begin to organize collectively and, um, do you think that there is a first um, a, a starting point? Like for me, when I look at it personally, I think uh, like uh, like directing energy toward systemic racism would be the first step to sh to begin um, uniting. Uh, but uh, I was just curious what uh, everyone's thoughts are and, and what the blueprint is to begin this. Thank you. Looking for other raised hands. Karina, your mic is open. Please open your mic on your end. There you yeah, are. Okay. Yeah, can yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, one thing that I would like this good gentleman to get into is how capitalism divides the working class to uh, unite against itself. Subdivisions of the working class, for example, one minority against another, blacks against Chinese immigrants, everybody uniting against women, and then. At the bottom of the barrel, there are the disabled workers who are united against by everybody. Can you get into uh, a little bit into how the subdivisions are encouraged by capitalism to fight against each other? Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Kevin, your mic is open. Hi, um, I was wondering, uh, Scott, do you think that the, sorry, the professional managerial class is a useful uh, subcategory for uh, contemporary developments in capitalism or do you think it obfuscates? Like, do you think it's, do you think it's useful or unnecessary? Because I've, I've heard it used different ways by different uh, Marxist theorists, and I just wonder what your thoughts on it are. Re repeat that question again. Okay. Uh, the professional managerial class, do you think that that's a useful subcategory for the way that capitalism has changed, you know, from industrialization and production in the 19th century to like modern service industry and tech and the academy and so forth? Or do you think that it it needlessly obfuscates uh, the contradictions between the bourgeois and the working class. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Looking for raised hands. Michael, your mic is open. Michael, yes. Yes, uh, the question I had would be, what would work and the market look like after a socialist transition um, when there was no more exploitation of surplus value? What would work look like, employment, um, things like that? Thank you. Looking for more raised hands. We'll take uh, Stephen. Your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. There you are. Speak up, please. 
Stephen, your mic is open. Please speak up. We can't hear you. Sorry. Mushin, your mic is open. Thank you very, very, very much. Uh, Professor Hadi, I have a couple of questions. One is that the, the, isn't there a change going on in the working class because the level of education, all the technology people that are coming into the, into the, into the workforce, uh, a lot of women coming into the workforce, and that generally I'm, I think it's true that the level of education is going up by the bit in there. And does it make in, in a difference in the composition of the working class, who is working class, who is not working class? I always understood that it is basically defined by a relationship with means of production. If you are not an ownership, not an owner of the means of production, you do not belong to the working class. Basically, that's one one issue. Second, to the way that you phrased and started the discussion, the differences between academic Marxists and non-academic Marxists, it concerns me a little bit because in the in the in the what is to be done, Lenin talks about the role of the of the revolutionary working class. They are supposed to be helpful in the raising the consciousness of the of the working class. So. That that concerns me about making the differentiation where where where, uh, where, where we are doing this. Thing. And third question is that you may not want to answer it. What do you think of Frederick Jameson as a Marxist, American Marxist? Thank you very much. Okay, you have a short period of time. Uh, maybe you want to. Um. Yeah. So I guess I'll um I'll respond to these questions. Um or these uh, comments and questions uh, now, and, and then we'll see where we uh, where we are with time. Um, so uh, uh, you have, uh, what is it, seven minutes? OK, yeah, so I don't think we'll be able to take any more. Um, how do we begin to organize collectively? Um, that's an excellent question. And I don't think there's a single starting point. I think you know we organize, we live collectively as workers. We depend on each other. Um, in in all aspects of our lives because we can't um, go it alone. So our whole life is is, is kind of uh, structured by collectivity, um, and there are a lot of ways of developing that you know consciously and and politically. Um, the labor movement is is obviously one. So organizing your workplace or if you're organized already, get getting involved in your union, um, getting involved in political struggle, um, whether around a candidate or around an issue is another. Um, developing, uh, as, as Carrie suggested, the fight against um, systemic uh, racism is, uh, is yet another. So uh, it's basic, so what, we're, what we are supposed to do as communists is kind of infuse all of our work and our lives with this spirit of, of collectivity. Um, so it happens everywhere. And, eventually those struggles converge, which is what we're seeing, I think, now. Uh, to Karina's question, yes, absolutely. Um, the divisions of, of white supremacy, of male supremacy, of ableism, of homophobia and, and transphobia uh, are massively powerful weapons in the hands of capital. They turn workers against each other. They they twist and deform uh, class consciousness, which is what I think you see among uh, the the sort of fascist leaning end of uh, of the spectrum. Um, it, it's an attempt by the ruling class to take this, class consciousness is rising. People know that capitalism is not working for them, but um, to a way to take this the the anger that should be directed at capital and turn it against other sections of the working class to provide some identity um, national identity racial identity whatever it is um, white uh, white identity as um, a substitute for working class uh, identity um, and we have to struggle against that constantly and in in every sphere. And in fact, um, uh, speaking of competition, uh, during the American Civil War, Marx, you know, in his role of, in the leadership of the First International, um, carried on a campaign of agitation and education among the workers 
uh, in England, the textile workers, because the English bourgeoisie, the, the textile manufacturers, favored the South. They wanted um, cheap cotton. They wanted cotton to, um, to stay available. Um, so they tried to bring workers into this idea that you know, the, the, the Civil War, the war for the liberation of um, enslaved labor in the United States was somehow contrary to their interests. And, and Marx said, article after article, no, that's not the case. And he eventually, you know, culminating in Capital, where he says, uh, labor uh, in the white skin cannot be free where labor in the black skin is branded. Um, so Marx understood very, very well um, the role of, of these divisions in hobbling uh, the working class. Um, the professional managerial class, uh, is it a good category? Um, as a class category, absolutely not. Um, there, there's a working class and there's a capitalist class and there's a middle class that I think we need to do a better job of understanding. But the, the prof there is a section of the working class that has uh, managerial duties that is, is um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, a stratum. Is that the word strata? Stratum of the uh, working class. Um, it, there are attempts to turn that section of, of the working class against others. There are people who exercise professional and managerial functions who are not members of the working class, you know, CEOs, executives, whatever, whose pay um, doesn't come out of the, the wage pool, but out of, out of um, the surplus value that's generated. Uh, but no, I, I don't see it as a good class category. Um, and in fact, managerial work, the work of coordinating uh, labor is something that will be required under, under socialism, but not um, pressed into the service of capital, obviously. Um, what will work and markets look like after the transition to socialism? Well, at the beginning, uh, probably, I mean, I, we're not going to see a, a disappearance of wage labor overnight. Um, although eventually uh, that, that wage relation where we give up our own work uh, will disappear. Uh, instead, what will happen is that we will have the freedom to transform our conditions of work, to decide collectively, both on the level of our uh, jobs and on the level of society, how the value we produce uh, will be used. Um, so it will be um, kind of in, in, ter in the terms that Lenin used, an advance of democracy, um, uh, a massive democratization uh, involving a rise in wages and elimination of the insecurity that you know people face where um, you're worried that you can't leave a job because you might not be able to pay your rent for the month. Um, so you have to stay in a, a dangerous, job or, or one where uh, with an abusive boss or um, or something like that. Um, and that's going to be the big, the, the democratization, I think, will be the big uh, turning of the corner. Um, revolutionary intellects, the role of revolutionary intellectuals. Um, I think you know, Lenin was writing about a very the working class at a very particular stage of development. Most of the working class in Russia was illiterate. Um, when Marx was writing, a good portion of the working class in England um, was uh, had, had little to no uh, formal education. Uh, and so the ideas of class struggle had to be brought in uh, from outside. That's not the case anymore. Um, the working class um, has changed. It, we now have, you know, we have a very highly skilled, highly educated uh, working class. Uh, we have a working class that is capable of, of that, that does in fact already uh, run production. The capitalists have almost no role except for um, holding the means of production. So the, the role of the, of intellect, the need for intellectuals to come into the working class is, um, not something I think that, that's really a, a pressing thing. Instead, we have um, the need to develop uh, intellectuals out of the working class, and more and more that's happening. And uh, Frederick Jameson 
um, I, I do enjoy uh, some of his work, and I think especially um, his work representing capital, which deals largely with the 25th chapter of capital, the general law of capitalist accumulation is a very uh, a very good one. Um, but he's not somebody who is uh, accessible to the engagement even for, you know, even for me, um, you know, even as somebody who has a, a lot of formal education. So um, thank you all for your time and attention, and I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Dee. Okay, thank you, Scott. And we will move into the second portion of this class, which, um, let me, okay. In this segment of the class, we want to restate how Marxists and the tradition of the communist movement in the United States determine class position. We want to take a look at the challenge to the Marxist analysis coming from some academics who are sympathetic to the working class reform cause, but disconnected from the working class revolutionary project. The project being the working class struggle to win a socialist future before imperialism destroys the earth. Marxism states very clearly that human societies are organized on the basis of socioeconomic systems. The socioeconomic systems have changed over time with a new system growing out of and replacing the old. The key features we look at to determine any socioeconomic system have to do with two factors, the forces of production, all of the means by which human beings engage in the production process, including technology, land, human labor skills, mach machinery, et cetera, and the relations human beings enter into in order to participate in the production process. Marx says the fundamentals of that relationship in a class society have to do with who owns what is required to engage in production, the productive means, and those who toil or do the work and have no other way to make a living. Under capitalism, those who own the productive means can be big or small capitalists, but they are capitalists because they are owners of productive means or private property as Marx would say. The distinction between big and small capitalists is important, and we will come back to this later. On the other side, we have those who do not own any private property. They may own houses and cars, even boats and summer homes. But if they don't own property engaged in production, then they do not own what Marxists mean by private property. Marx makes it very clear, no matter how great or little your income, if your only means of obtaining a living, of keeping a roof over your family's head, food on your family's table, and clothes on your family's back, is to sell your ability to labor, is to offer your ability to do work in exchange for a wage if you have no other way to secure any portion of a living then you are a member of the working class and a wage slave we are slaves to wages because even though conscious working even though conscious members of the working class know we are exploited in this arrangement we cannot stop this arrangement or leave this arrangement because we have no other way to live. These, there are objective 
factors that all members of the working class face in common under capitalism, no matter race, gender, nationality, age, etc. Those objective factors include inequality. The mere fact of being a member of the working class means you are in a position of inequality. We normally speak of inequality as it relates to race, nationality, and gender. But Marx says the reason why democracy under capitalism is deformed and limited is because of the fundamental inequality between those who own productive property and those who do not. All other inequalities under capitalism become linked and intertwined with inequality based on class. Lenin developed these connecting concepts and in place of Marx's call for workers of the world to unite, Lenin added workers of the world and oppressed peoples unite. This is not an effort to reduce everything to class, no. This is to firmly state that the challenge under capitalism is to see the relationship between all other forms of inequality and class inequality. This is a requirement of the Marxist project, and we will come back to this point later. Objectively under capitalism, and other factors that all members of the working class face include exploitation, meaning the surplus we produce in the process of working is taken by someone else, insecurity, meaning wage declines, unemployment, and economic downturn, downturns are always threatened, alienation, meaning the separation of the worker from control over the product produced, separation from control over the production process, and separation from control over one's own life. We might consider that what we call apathy within the working class may in fact be a product of alienation. Additional objective factors all working class people face are oppression, social domination, discrimination, and inferiority. All these objective factors originate or originate from or are survivals from the past that find new expression in the very nature of capitalism. And all working class people experience these objective realities to one degree or another. All working class people suffer the ills of capitalism. And we have to acknowledge that there are added factors that increase the degree of suffering, race, gender, nationality, and age, to name a few. Because capitalism facilitates our exploitation and oppression as working class people, it renders all of us unequal to those who own, be they large or small capitalists. Academics sympathetic to the working class reform cause say, the concept of the working class as developed by Marx is outdated and that today the working class has segmented into three separate classes distinguished not by ownership or no ownership of productive means, but by the control, power, and authority one has in their workplace. All those who have a college degree no matter how little they earn, are candidates for the middle class in this framework. The middle class is said to be a separate class from the non-college educated working class 
who are said to be in a separate class from those who are poor. It is not one model. Academics differ as to who's where and why, but the commonality is that academics know of but replace the Marxist framework for a deviation that might win that might win them some attention for originality in the world of academia. Maybe that's an explanation. There could be others. Academic treatment of the class question today. So we're going to rely on quotes from a few works. Barbara Jensen, who is a white woman who hails from the working from the non-college educated segment of the working class, but then went to college and became a psychologist. And so she shares her experience. All of these people are white and they're, except Bell Hooks, and I'll talk about her later. And they're sharing the experience that they had within the white community as they moved from non-college educated uh, work, the, the a non-college educated segment of the working class into the college educated segment of what is called the middle class by these uh, academics. So quote, in middle class life, getting at least a four year college degree is expected. And it matters a lot whether one goes to the best schools, quote, I uncover a wide cultural divide between the professional middle class who mostly use their minds to work and the working class who use their hands and heads, end of quote. Quote, the function of the BA degree is to certify that a person is a candidate in good standing for the middle class. It is the great social divider that distinguishes the working class from the middle class." End of quote. From Jensen continued, quote, the memory of a century of large scale workers movements and the common use of words and phrases like working class and class struggle as well as a powerful psychological sense of us as workers was obscured by the expanded new middle class. End of quote. And from uh, Zweig, who wrote uh, The Working Class Majority, America's Best Kept Secret, quote, I define classes in large part based on the power and authority people have at work. A relative handful of people have great power to organize and direct production, while a much larger number have almost no authority. In a capitalist society such as ours, the first group is the capitalist class. The second group is the working class. There is also a middle class. It includes professional people, small business owners, and managers and supervisors who have authority over others at work. The middle class is caught between the working class and the capitalist class." End of quote. Continuing, quote, capitalists and workers are not the only classes in America. There is also a middle class made up of professional people, supervisors and managers and small business owners. End of quote. Quote, as the working class has disappeared from polite conversation, the middle class has come to be accepted as the social position most Americans are in. I am not saying these academics are the enemy. No, they are not the enemy. And while we do not embrace their framework, in fact, we reject their determination of class position because it labels differences within the working class as a qualitative class distinction when, in fact, the, difference, the differences in education 
income and style of life and work are just quantitative from a Marxist point of view. Their view weakens the working class and therefore objectively does not serve our interests. Yet we are concerned about what they have to say related to culture because their work helps to distinguish the working class from other class forces. While the academics say they are describing the culture of the middle class, by their own definition, they are describing the culture of the small capitalist or petty bourgeois class whose influence over the higher income sections of the working class is evident. So cultural features of what really is the small capitalist class or the petty bourgeoisie. From Jensen, the presumption is, quote, we all work as individuals in competition, end of quote. The middle class develops, quote, skills that work in, comp in a competitive society, but not necessarily in a, com in a cooperative one, end of quote. The, quote, the cultivation of the ego heavy eye, end of quote. Quote, the longer people have belonged to the American middle class, the more individuality, competition, and having power over others figure significantly in, into what feels right, end of quote. Quote, individuality, standing out, and competition are central are central cultural features of middle-class life." End of quote. Quote, the upper middle class sets the standards that the rest of the middle class, and remember, we know they're talking about the small uh, capitalist, the petty bourgeoisie, the rest of the middle class aspires toward. The rest of the middle class scrambles to keep up with these winners, end of quote. That's from Jensen. Continuing with Jensen, quote, it was not merely a matter of different cultures, but of one dominating the other, end of quote. And going to Metzger, who wrote, uh, who wrote Bridging the Divide, Working Class Culture in a Middle Class Society. Quote, the middle class naively assumes that everybody, and by that he means the petty bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie naively, assu naively assumes that everybody is as concerned with status and rank as they are and that there is a singular and uniform hierarchy that everyone recognizes." End of quote. Jensen again, the quote, the middle class is employed by the upper or capitalist class to inflict severe control and sometimes appalling abuse and neglect on so-called lower class workers. End of quote. Um, quote, Classism is also societal or systemic domination. Systemic classism is a sometimes deliberate, sometimes inadvertent, dehumanizing and bullying of working class people. As we can see, these cultural traits aid the individual to distinguish themselves as independently successful and their college education, income, and control and authority in the world of their work life proves it. Individualism, interpersonal competition, and independence are their cultural highlights. Academics describe the cultural traits of working class people, and we must be mindful that the researchers say 
the cultural traits of the non-college educated section of the working class and the poor are very similar, if not the same. So the academics describe the cultural traits of working class people as follows. Quoting Jensen, combating classism involves a deeper understanding of working class people, their real lives and cultural norms that are not based on individualism and competition, but rather on community, caring, and mutual aid. End of quote. Quote, uh, working class people consider individualism and, comp and competitiveness rude or wrong. End of quote. Quote, still I have found some similar working class values across radically different ethnicities, caring connections with others within the group, communal values of sharing and helping, trust of feelings and personal stories, loyalty and family-like bonds with others, end of quote. Quoting from Metzger, integrity is more valued in working class life than among middle class professionals, end of quote. Jensen, quote, uh, before, um, Jensen, working class people around the world, quote, have also testified to having a strong cultural value of belonging or community mindedness as opposed to developing individuality and competitiveness, end of quote. Quote, the resilient qualities of working class life, cooperation, loyalty, strength, and stand up for rather than competing against one another, end of quote. Quote, they place a very high value on honesty, trustworthiness, competence, and resilience. They also pride themselves on hard work." End of quote. And from Metzger, again, quote, working class commitment to belonging is born of need. With fewer financial resources and opportunities, reciprocal obligations within a circle of family, friends, and workmates are often necessary for survival. As we can see, non-college educated working class and poor people display more of an orientation toward interdependence instead of independence and cooperation instead of competition and collectivity instead of individualism. And we have to be mindful. I'm not arguing that these, uh, are, these traits are not displayed among the college educated, that's what the researchers, the researchers have actually put the college ed educated in with the small capitalists, the petty bourgeoisie. So that's the distortion, really. The cultural patterns are displayed by working class people throughout the world. These are the common features of working class culture that grow out of the objective com commonalities of social being the objective commonalities of the experience of all members of the working class. Where do we go from here? The, clap, the capitalist class is attacking the working class from all sides. We're in a difficult situation, so what is the way forward? As Zweig would, says, uh, and he wrote the book, uh, The Working Class Majority, America's, America's Best Kept Secret. As Wag says, quote, anger needs a target. Hope needs a way out, end of quote. In response to the assault on the working class by big capital, what if we initiated a massive campaign to reassert our working class identity culture and the struggle for the advance of our rights as a class in this country. African Americans have an interest in this effort. From a Marxist point of view, it is the only path to our victory as a people. 
The working class identity helps white working class people to understand who they are. The reality is only by understanding who they are as working class people can they understand who we are as part of the working class, but also as an oppressed people who experience oppression ac across class lines, experience oppression as a whole. We, who we are, cannot be fully understood outside of the context of the working class. Two, the ruling class in, in campaigning against the struggle against racism is actually attempting to hide their primary bloody hand and the role of capitalism in perpetuating racism. Under the guise of preventing white people from experiencing guilt, they are actually trying to hide the fact that they, as the ruling class and the system of capitalism, are the guilty perpetuators of sadistic crimes against people of color in this country. In the 1600s, they deliberately decided that Africans would be singled out for permanent enslavement as a way to break the unity emerging among the African and European indentured servants. The working class is not responsible for the mess of the past or present. The ruling class is in charge and they wield their power masterfully. Even today, we are being deliberately manipulated by a ruling class fighting for its preservation, exclusive interests, and savage domination over all others. Women have an interest in this effort, the reassertion of our working class identity as well. In the context of the working class identity, working class men can distinguish themselves from the barbaric misogyny and male supremacy perpetuated from ruling class quarters, but penetrating every aspect of our society and national culture. Working class men have an interest in standing with working class women as we join with all women in the fight for women's equality and reproductive rights against capitalist um, oppression. This is a dynamic that Lenin explained, and we have to do the work to understand that the fight for women's equality is a working class struggle and part of the work of the uh, class struggle. Struggling to understand who we are as a class includes struggling to understand our relationship to other classes. Small business people, the petty bourgeoisie, are not the enemy either. But, but as we have seen, they are culturally different from the working class. Let me see what the time is. So here we have a, co a collection of quotes that indicate that the uh, uh, middle class, the so-called middle class is also suffering. The African-American experience demonstrates that when working class forces are in relationship with other classes, the working class forces have to struggle to lead and, and have and to have its working class interests dominate. It is an example worth exploring. Our working class identity in all its different ethnic, racial, national, gender, age, ability, flavorings has the purpose of distinguishing us historically as the working class from ruling class abuses 
and the crimes of capitalism, strengthening the subjective basis of unity by developing a deeper understanding of the objective reality that we face in common and the degrees of difference in extra exploitation and added oppression, which provide billions more in extra profits from and added suffering for people of color and women workers. The U.S. working class is facing many challenges. It grows its, it must grow its organized section and it must grow the class unity in the fight against racism and sexism. And we must grow our identity as the working class. Right now, the immediate issues around which struggles are developing include union organizing, the fight against voter suppression, and the fight for a woman's right to choose. There are other pivotal issues, but I would argue union organizing, growing class consciousness and class identity, and helping to build movements, at least uh, helping to build movements around at least the core issues are central. And I'll end with this uh, quote from Zweig, uh, a resurrection, quote, a resurrection of working class social, political, and cultural life, even, even as they define it, proudly defined as such, would contribute to the strengthening, again, of working people's sense of dignity as well as increasing the power and authority of working people in the larger society, end of quote. And let's throw in Jensen, quote, when the working class has organized for better economic treatment, as it often has in American history, it had done so in spite of deep ethnic, geographic, gender, and color differences, forging a new and larger sense of us. We'll now open the floor uh, for discussion of these questions. Uh, and I'd like for respondents to uh, choose one question to which you will respond. What have been your experiences in the context of class in this country? Or what do you think we can do to promote our identity as working class USA. So I will, um, if you'd like to speak, please um, raise your, uh, click the raised hand icon and I will go through and call on. Giles, your, your mic is open. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> oh, good. Yeah, um, throughout most of my life, you know, I was always told like everything I'm doing is wrong and I've always seen how other people seem to have direction and I don't. I mean, mm -hmm. then one day a situation happened in which a friend of mine was brutally harassed and tortured by the police and shipped off to jail. He didn't get a chance for him to say anything. And then when he come back, he was like a mindless vegetable. Couldn't even say words or anything. I don't think they did damage his throat or anything, but you know, he it's like he's lacked cognition. And then that was the day I started to question everything, including capitalism. And then we're going to try to get some other people, uh, Giles. So if you can sum up, please. Oh, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, we live in a time we can make the case for communist ideals and stuff. But whenever elections happen, that's when people want to do the messaging. What I want to know is, can we keep the message going even if we lose elections? Because you got to strike with the iron tire. OK, thank you. Looking for more raised hands.
looking for more raised hands. Luke, you can open your mic. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dee, for the presentation. It was great. Um, I want to say uh, for the question, what do I think we can do to promote our identity as working class USA? is um, ultimately more things uh, like this, like these presentations that um, dispel the myths, you know, that there is somehow a separate middle class separate from the working class. Um, and also, we need to um, spread these messages in struggle. Um, right now, my co-chair is at a women's march, and we need to go out there um, as working class people engaging with other working class people, because as, uh, you know, Scott said in the first presentation, Theory and tactics are not reserved for some special minority of the communist movement. You know, it is the working class uh, that must decide the future. That is how we lead ourselves to revolution. So, um, yeah, we should, you know, increase uh, educational um, efforts and, you know, obviously find uh, our identity in the struggle and uh, work with other workers. And, yeah, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Rosanna, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end. Rosanna. Rosanna, you have to click the picture of the mic to open it with your mouse cursor. Okay. There you Here, are. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, yeah, I wanted to kind of uh, share an experience I had uh, in in its application of of the theory and everything like this. When I was younger, um, <clears throat> I worked as a as a teacher aide uh, and for adults with developmental disabilities, and we were pretty much all women. We worked together. We didn't have any uh, really breaks away from the students or lunches. We ate with them and all of this kind of thing. But we 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 built this, um, I guess, collect uh, working relationship as as Scott was talking about, you know, where we helped each other and uh, we we needed to go to the restroom and all that kind of thing, and we we looked out for each other. Uh, <clears throat> then came a time when we were being cut, our salaries were starting to be cut, and uh, all of these other things were happening, and at one point they started uh, cutting our medical care. And one of the things that they cut was uh, gynecology. And as I mentioned, we were all women. Um, and so to cut gynecology uh, was just kind of like the, the, was it the straw that broke the camel's back? And really uh, um, unexpectedly to me was that even some of the women who I thought was were conservative, they were ready to walk out. And in fact, we did, we got, we, we organized uh, I actually, at the time I was already a member of the party and so I reached out to some of my comrades with union experience and we uh, we organized to to uh, vote in a union, uh, we did that. And then we um, also then all walked out to, to uh, in protest of this whole thing. So I, I say this because, you know, sometimes we we are looking perhaps for kind of set guidelines or blueprints or things like that. And it really happens in, in your workplace, in the in your community, as you're working together, you're building these relationships. And, and, and there comes a moment and an opportunity that you will see because you've been in this, in this scene, in this uh, uh, building of this community or you know, participating in this, that you, the moment will come where it's time to move to the next level of building that consciousness, of building that worker power, and and being able to um, to organize at a deeper level. Um, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Looking for raised hands. Joseph Range, your mic is open. Open your mic on your end by clicking the picture of the mic on your control panel. Joseph Rains. 
Okay, we'll move on. Sorry to bother you. Lawrence Carroll, your mic is open. Click the picture of the mic on your end to open. Okay, we'll move on. Lori, I'm opening your mic now. There you are. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Dee. I just wanted to say in the response to the second question that those two sets of values that you were contrasting, the values on individualism and competition are profoundly alienating and mentally unhealthy values. And they, they rob people of life satisfaction. And it's the working class values that um, actually provide people with sense of belonging and identity. And um, uh, it seems to me that, that that's something that um, people are often just missed when they're, they're taught to define success as like standing out from other people and, and so on. And, you know, maybe if it's possible to kind of um, tear the veil away and to um, uh, help people em embrace those other values that are more revolutionary, but also more, more healthy for the individual as well. Thank you. Lowell Denny, I will be opening your mic. Your mic is- Thank you. Yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you for this presentation. Also, thanks, Scott. Um, I want to answer the first question, which I think dovetails neatly into the second question as well. Um, and it was my experience as a union rep with um, at my job, obviously, um, just before contract negotiations, we had nominations open for offices in our local. And come to find out, and I'm not saying this to brag, but to illustrate the point I'm going to make, I got, it turns out, the most nominations from my coworkers. Well, who were these coworkers that nominated me? They ranged the gamut from the apolitical to hardcore Democrats, hardcore Republicans, hardcore non-voters, and hardcore Trump, um, Trump supporters. Um, and what I've learned from that and continue to try to drive home to people who engage in any kind of political forum is that it was around the issues that I fought for as a union rep that my coworkers were interested in. They knew of my and they knew of my membership at that time in the party, and we would argue about that in the break room, um, have civil discussions, heated discussions. Ultimately, they did not care about that. They cared about our um, our issues in the workplace and how um, the, the role I play with them in trying to resolve those issues. That's what became important. So I always take that as a lesson that we should all take and I continue to take that it's around these issues, which is our identity, I think. It's the issues that we're fighting for. Um, it's not our political affiliations. It's not whether we vote or not. It's how can we resolve an issue like today, women's right to control their bodies, right? We can come from different perspectives and fight for that issue. So that's my contribution. Thank you. Okay, so we will end uh, the discussion at this point. I want to thank everyone for your contribution. And I actually want to thank everyone for uh, spending your Saturday morning with us. Um, and I'd like to invite you to stay with us because in the afternoon, we'll have our last class for this series uh, concerning uh, winning uh, against the threat of fascism today. And that class will start at one o'clock Eastern. So we're going to leave everything up and open uh, and you can just come back, uh, set your timer or whatever and come back at one o'clock uh, Eastern. We will continue to pursue these matters uh, 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 toward uh, strengthening our ability as a class to stand up for ourselves, to um, relate to other mo movements uh, that uh, we that have an interest in uh, advancing the fight for democracy, 
and uh, and uh, creating in party set settings uh, what I think are sanctuaries for working class people. Okay, so thank you, Scott, and thank you everyone for participating in this class. We will break now for about uh, 30 minutes and the next class will start at one o'clock Eastern. Thank you very much for participating in this class. <laughs>